want to know what the movers and shakers of New Hampshire's performing arts are thinking? Welcome to New Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. Welcome. Hey, nice to meet you. It's so good to have you. So good to have you. Real honor. Thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem. Let's jump right in. Sure. Who is Keith Wyrick? And what's your background or how, before we ever get to the Peacock, let me know how this passion for what you do came about. Where's, where's all that deriving from? Wow. Um, I didn't know we were going to get all therapeutic right away. Uh, um, also uh, the Dr. Phil show. Um, you know, I was, a, um, uh, I was a young kid in, I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Mistake on the lake. <laughs> um, it was a great place to grow up. I had a very happy childhood. Um, I was uh, a very strange, um, energetic, and um, playful kid. Um, but I had this um, uh, I have a birthmark on the uh, left side of my face, which made me terribly um, self conscious, I think. So um, I enjoyed certainly a lot of projected play. Um, played pretty heavily with Star Wars figures and, um, you know, out in the, out in the sandbox and um, snow banks. Um, and um, I think a lot of that projection I see is pretty much what I do now. Mm-hmm. Is basically I, I use the same avatars. I just use the kids at Peacock Players. They're my Star Wars figures, and I just move them around the sandbox. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think, I guess it's not so sort of a surprise to me that I'm a director now. Um, I don't know. I had a very um, active fantasy life, and um, my dad came home from work one day. Um, My dad's a blue-collar guy, and my mom worked in a white-collar accountant office um, for Erie Insurance. And my dad was driving home one day, and neither one of them were particularly theater people. My older brother, Kevin, was kind of a sports kid. Um, I just didn't take to any of it. I I didn't really have many talents (laughs) In, in that field um, but um, my folks were really aware that I would do all these really funny character voices and um, that I sort of lived in this weird fantasy world most of the time so they um, my dad came home and he heard about the local youth theater company the Erie Playhouse was doing a production of The Wizard of Oz and they were looking for munchkins and I, I think I just turned 8 years old and um, my son now is eight, so like I'm, I'm watching him to see if there's any Munchkin ability, Munchkin, yeah, <laughs> tendencies. But um, I don't think so at this point. <laughs> um, it's not genetic, then, huh? No, not yet. Not yet, anyway. Um, and uh, uh, he heard on the radio that they were doing the show. Was interested if I wanted to do it. I mean, back then the Wizard of Oz came on TV, like you know two times a year or something yeah. like that. always came on uh, somewhere around uh, after Thanksgiving, before Christmas, and I was obsessed with that show. I mean, it was, it was fantasy at its greatest, right? right. Um, and I would do all those voices. My parents would even jokingly invite their friends over, and they would have parties, and they would turn the sound down on the television, and they would let me do all the voices of all the different munchkins. and all, all on the, child abuse. All the characters, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> he would gladly say absolutely. Um... And so he asked if it was something I wanted to do, and my mom was real supportive about it. And they didn't, we didn't have any idea what the theater world was. They took me down for this audition, and um, I ended up being cast as um, one of the three lollipop guild yes. little grumpy guys. I was the one with the little, the, the two little spit curls. Um, and I had so much fun doing it. Um, it wasn't a thing that I was familiar with. It wasn't a thing that my parents were familiar with. They were great stage parents, like they weren't. Oh yeah, helicoptery, or they, you know, they weren't they weren't right all about it. They just kind of let me do my thing, and um, yeah, I just well, I, that's because I, they didn't see the hidden potential yet. Had they known? Oh, I don't think they, I, I don't think anybody <laughs> thought there was any potential. There. Um, <laughs> it was just fun, you know. And I always liked being in the theater. I, I always liked spending more time being someone other than myself. Yeah. Um, and I see that reflected in the kids that I work with now. So that's. Um, uh, in a weird way, that's 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 very full circle for me. But so that put the hook in you. Did you carry that on through high school and then college? Very much so. Yeah, um, yeah I, I did it. I did theater pretty exclusively um, and pretty aggressively. 
um, all through my childhood, all through high school. I remember going into my high school guidance counselor and saying, he was like, what do you want to do for a living? It was sophomore year of high school. And the guidance counselor said, what do you want to do for a living? And I said, oh, I want to be a, a professional working actor. And I never said famous. I never said rich. I said I wanted to be a professional actor. And he was like, well, that's a great hobby, but what do you want to do for, Learn to wait for a bread job? <laughs> and I was like, no, I know that's a real thing. I know that's a... I always always viewed professional actors as a as a blue collar job. You know, it was it was it was a craft, and I understood that um, even at a young age. Mm-hmm. I had seen it. I, I had been able to be around it, um, so I knew that was a thing. Um, I think people you know responded because of my uh, you know uh, birthmark. I think they just thought, oh, this is not going to happen for this kid. Oh. And I wasn't pretty. I mean, I've never been. But you're not a freaking Darth Vader. No, I'm no bridge troll, but I. <laughs> Um, but I, I think people thought, oh, that, that's not going to happen for him. I mean, you've got to be really, you know, you've got to be one of these yeah. you know, drop-dead beautiful yeah. people. Charlton be. Heston. And I was like, no, that's not true. I mean, I, you could see on TV. I mean, there were Brian Dennehy's and there were, um, you know, Gene Hackman wasn't particularly handsome. Yeah, handsome. You know, there was no matinee idol or anything like that. So I was like, I know this, this, that this exists. Like, there are real people working in the theater. Um, I remember getting a new guidance counselor. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and, and I had a lot of really great educators. I mean, some some of the best. I, I, in a weird way, I've sort of all, sort of amalgamated them into one human being. Are these but, theater teachers you're talking? Yeah, about? specifically some real great theater oh. Jedi masters who I worked with. And the, I think the first, um, a, a lot of them at the Erie Playhouse, absolutely. I mean, I had great directors: Leo Estes, John Burton. Rich Davis, I mean, these people really took care of us, David Matthews, and really, they, they put the spark there, right, which is something that was never going to stop for me, yeah. um, but it was uh, Kathleen Canarosi in high school, it was my high school drama teacher, she taught um, English and the Humanities, and she taught um, specifically children's theater, um, she now lives out in California, and, and um, that is her life's work, is, is, is still, is, is still, yeah, it's, she's That's a very, impressive. very inspiring human being. Um, and I still hear all of their teachings come out of my mouth on a regular ba- on a wow. daily basis. Um, but she really she really put the um, she she put a vocabulary to the spark that I had, right? That there was a real craft there, and that there was objective, there was tactics. She would start to teach me about Stanislavski and Uta Hagen and, and Stella Adler and where this stuff was coming from. And I was getting this at a, re- a relatively young age in high school. Um, but she was. Um, relentless and very, very um, clever about the way she would would impart this stuff. She was um, she made it all seem like it was your your idea that you sought it out. When when I'm sure she, there was always steerage there, there was always direction, there yeah. was and, and careful steerage at that. Um, you know, she was very instrumental in, in getting us to go see professional theater and taking us to New York City. In high school? In high school. It was my freshman year in high school. It was my first trip to Broadway. And um, <laughs> my first Broadway show was Cats. And I remember thinking at that You're time... You're forgiven. That's all right. I remember thinking at that time that it was the best thing I had ever seen hey, in my life. At the time it was, right? It was well known for... And, yeah. you know, the next night she would take us to see Les Mis and previews. Seriously? And... Uh, you know that changed my life. Yeah. I, I didn't know a musical could be that, um, and uh, musicals can be so many things, right? Um, you know, she taught us Shakespeare and Chekhov and Ibsen, and we oh wrote we God. wrote our own plays. And we, she she formed a. Uh, we were all founding members of uh, uh, what she called CTE, which is a children's theater ensemble, which she. She specifically, her her life's work was really devoted toward children's theater and developing educational theater that targeted youth. And uh, obviously that, that was something that was going to stay with me um, throughout um, my life. But um, This is all still in high school? This is all in high school, yeah. Um, wow. What a rich environment. But she opened up the world to me. She opened up the, the, the theater programs um, that I could attend. Um, she helped me rehearse my stuff. Uh, I mean, it's you know certainly harder now for these kids nowadays. But um, being a male in you know in musical theater, it wasn't it wasn't as difficult for me as I, I would I would say it is yeah. <laughs> um, f- for the females. But um, 
uh, you know, she got me where I needed to go to school, and then I eventually, I um, eventually ended up at Otterbein College in Columbus, Ohio, Westerville, Ohio. Um, and Otterbein's a great program. Um, I had a double major in music and theater, um, which was a lot to do in four years. Um, but so you played music in high school as well? Yeah, a little bit of piano. I wasn't that. I was never very good. I had short, little, fat, stubby <laughs> fingers. So um, wasn't my talent. But um, yeah, vocal performance and and theater. They didn't have a musical theater major at the time at Otterbein. Now they do, is my understanding. And the only way to really kind of do it back then was the double major but I worked in the box office at Otterbein I worked in a scene shop for work study I got an awful lot of scholarship from those fine people yeah. and a great great education I mean the the Jedi masters who really took it to the next level Ed Vaughn Dennis Romer Dr. John Stefano these guys were I mean they they, they took a very rough off the shelf kid and really taught them the craft in, 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 in the best possible way. And I got a lot of experience on stage, which was really great. Um, but I think the real, the big formulative change was really our, um, when you're at Otterbein, uh, part of the BFA degree for theater is that you intern in um, either a casting office or um, a talent agency, and you could go to one of three cities. You could go to L.A., Chicago, or New York. Now, my master, Ed, um, he was dead set that I was going to New York City and that I should be in a casting office. He, he always kept saying to me, he goes, you sure you don't want to be a director? You sure you don't want to change it? And I was like, no, I don't want to be a director. I'm way too selfish. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be in the spotlight. So what's the purpose of working in it? Why, did, why was the drive to put you in something like that? Well, we didn't have a showcase uh, like some schools do, like Boko or, or Carnegie Mellon or UMish, like they have showcases where you know agents come to see you when you graduate, and then agents pick you up and sign you off for that. The internship was really to give you a good idea of the business okay. side of it. So I w ended up working for a casting office in New York City, and I did this in my senior year of, of college. Um, and then um, I worked for Stuart Howard Associates, was I, which was a, a, a I don't know. Maybe it was like the third biggest casting office at the time there. They did film and television stuff, but they did do some big Broadway shows. Um, we talked earlier in, in the front room about working on Laughter on the 23rd yeah. Floor. Um, and I was involved with that. I was involved with the big revival of Chicago um, uh, that uh, Annie Rankin produced. Um, and I was just in the casting office for a lot of this stuff. Uh, Best Little Whorehouse Goes Public. I work with um, Fran and Barry Weisler with the Namco organization. Did but you have to audition, or, or was it? Did you have a little bit special in because you were working in the casting office? How did How did that happen? How did you get in those shows? Well, uh, really, it just started. I was Coffee Boy. You know, I mean, that was my internship. I was just Coffee Boy. So um, for the four months that I worked in a casting office in New York. Um, you know, Stuart was having me go to, he taught a, um, he, Stuart Howard himself actually taught a acting audition class at Juilliard. So I would go with him and I was the reader. Like I would just read with these kids at Juilliard who are phenomenal, phenomenal artists. And I, yeah, of course you're learning the entire time, right? Or, you know, he's casting a new comedy and Jerry Zaks is directing and I'm sitting behind the table with Stuart and Jerry Zaks and Neil Simon and... And Fran and Barry Weisler, and I guess I was I was on the the other side of the table long before I would stand in front of it, mm. um, and that was really a valuable experience, mm. incredibly. Um, and my job was to shut up, yeah, keep your mouth shut, your eyes open, and um, get everybody's coffee and bagels and, and schmears and um, let people in. Maybe occasionally read with uh, I think I read once with uh, I read an audition with Sigourney Weaver once. I was totally geeked Seriously? out about it. I was. Totally geeked out about it. I met Nathan Lane once. I met you know all those guys on Laughter in the 23rd Name Floor. Name dropper. I'm dropping them all. You might as well. I'm dropping them all. Let me ask you a question real quick. Did you say you were in Chicago? No, I was not in it. Okay. No. I no. I just worked. Not a, because I don't think office. that you have the legs for dancing. Well, but. <laughs> Fosse certainly uses uh, unorthodox physical types. I'll give you that, but I, I don't even think he's that. Okay. I just wanted to like, clear that out of my mind. No. Okay. In fact, I served as. Uh, I served as Joel Gray's bodyguard. For Are you week. kidding me? Yep. I just had to stand behind him and look mean and threatening. Um, he's a super nice guy. Really nice guy. Very gentlemanly. Very I sweet. I am impressed. Yeah, so I, Gary Weaver, Joel Gray, oh, Neil Simon. Oh, it gets better. And then 
um, this this internship would come to an end. It would break my heart. I go back to school. I finish out. Did a, did my last two shows at school, and then um, and then the day comes. I graduate and I get my ass to New York as soon as I can. Hop on a Greyhound bus, two suitcases, um, and um, I get an equity card very very quickly. And um, I need a bread job, so I go back to Stewart. And I said, hey, any chance I could work in the casting office? And he hires me as his assistant. So my first job job in New York is working in the casting office. And, you know, he's he's just a really funny and enig- enigmatic guy. Um, but he was, I don't know. I don't know. He really, I, maybe it was because of the Midwest all over me, but I, I think he, he just kind of took a shine to me. He, th- he thought I was a, a nice and reliable and earnest kid. And um, he liked having me around. And I'd go get his dry cleaning, and I would... Yeah, so what's amazing for him? Yes, yeah, so during this whole time, you're picking up things by either through osmosis or on purpose, right? You're you're taking note, which is huge education. You you can't really pay for that. A hundred percent. I think that it's all of that. I mean, I, there, there's great teaching underneath it, but there was this weird serendipitous experience mm-hmm. that um, I, I I I never take for granted, um, and. Uh, yeah, that's uh, you're in a unique position at this point. I don't know how many people would realize that. But. He sat, and I didn't really know it. I was young and dumb enough to not really know. I mean, I knew I was meeting famous people and eating cheeseburgers with Nathan Lane, and you know, but like, uh, and I was geeked out about it the entire time. But um, I, it wasn't really until Stewart. We were in a cab once. We were coming back from an audition from Radio City. We were uh, auditioning w- one of the Christmas spectaculars. It was a Rockettes audition, which was of course a highlight in my life. <laughs> and um, we were driving back in this cab, and he said, "Is there any way, any way at all, that I could talk you out of doing the acting thing? Because you're good at the casting thing." And I said, "No, I don't think you're good." Um, and he uh, he said, "Well, then, if you're gonna do it, then you're gonna do it right." And he made a phone call, and. He called uh, this guy named Jim Flynn, um, and he was a talent agent uh, in New York. Not a big one by any means of the imagination. In fact, he, uh, uh, Jim, Bo- uh, Jim Flynn worked for Bowman Bowles and Flynn, um, and they were they specialized in character actors. You know, character acting. Mm-hmm. I think their big claim to fame was Sam Shepard was one of their really, um, yeah, one of their writing clients. So like Sam was like their their big ticket item, right? Um, and I think Pete Gurney and. They had a couple writer things, but, like, their actors, I mean, their acting roster wasn't, you know, it was just character types. They mm-hmm. played dads and construction workers and and that kind of stuff. And he had me sing for Jim, um, and Jim really liked me, and um, we had a great conversation. I really liked Jim. I thought he was nice, and I had met enough at, enough theater types, business types in the theater community to kind of know which ones I thought were... Slick, yeah, and which ones were kind yeah, of. I bet you had good radar by then. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. and um, he offered to you know uh, to put me up, and um, I, he would send me out for auditions, and I would go get my own auditions, and the deal was he would take fifteen percent if I booked anything that he had sent me in for, and he would take ten percent if it was something I just booked on my own. Well, that's um, gracious of him. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but he was putting me in front of a lot of people, and I was really grateful. I mean, I was just thinking. Was this for stage or theater? I mean, uh, Mostly or, stage. Okay. He, yeah, he sent me out. I didn't really do any. I had a real dearth of film and, and television stuff, but um, I was always really self-conscious oh, yeah. about doing that stuff. But I, I went in for it. Um, no, it was really stage stuff. I, I, I have a love affinity with the, the theater. The, the, I, it's the, un, it's the, the immediacy, yeah. the, the unity where everybody, you know. Like, even this podcast is being edited, and, yeah. and people are listening to it far long after we're having the conversation. Like, I like right. the conversation in a moment. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, so he started sending me out for stuff. I, I would book um, My Fair Lady with Richard Chamberlain, which was a big deal. Um, it was a big deal. Um, yes, These are yes. the things that my mom wants me to brag about, so. Hi, Mom. Um, um which had a very short Broadway run, but then we did a European tour, and then I would follow them. When I got done, I was like, okay, great. The dream was to get on Broadway and be a professional performer. Now what do I do? And, like, the dream didn't really go further than that. 
So I thought, oh, we'd, we'd do it again. So right? you didn't have stuff in the queue, or are you? Or the no. the show just ended, and you're. No, yeah, the show it ran its normal term, um, and it had it had a really short run in New York, but it was very good. Um, Melissa Errico played. Um, it was the last revival before this recent one revival that's now at Lincoln Center. Um, but we did the European tour. It's great. I always tell my kids, if you can ever do a European tour, do it, because it's like a full paid vacation. <laughs> you work two hours a night. It's great. But we were. Uh, I think in the end we played something like 17 different countries and really in a year and a half and yeah like I lived in Paris for a month I lived in Berlin Breaking for three my months heart. it was great me? it was great I would I would I've been to LOL <laughs> I've been to LOL <laughs> I've never played LOL so you got that on me <laughs> um yeah I, I would without question develop a taste for finer things mm. um and then I'd come back and we we'll do Victor Victoria with Julie Andrews, which is kind of the big one. I mean, it doesn't get bigger than this, right? And I don't know. You keep dropping the bigger names. No, so it, I don't know. that's it. It doesn't get bigger than Julie Andrews okay. ever. Um, and that was fun. I mean, it was. And then there was the first national tour of that. So like, um, we were all over the place. And I think I did that. That's the longest run I did. I think it was almost two years. Um, Can but, I pause here for a second? And, yeah, and there's ask a lot you, going on. No, it's okay. I, I, I'm curious about because I know there's a lot of people who. Who, know, who want to do theater, did it ever feel like a job to you? Did you ever get tired of it? Did you ever... Because I know there's the glamour of it. People always think, oh, I'm on Broadway, I'm on... But even if you're with Julie Andrews, at some point, it just becomes a job, does it not? Absolutely. I, I don't want to gloss over how Absolutely. hard it is. It, and it's not It's not a hard job. Like, yeah. you know, my father's a... You know, a blue collar work, you know, steel work. Yeah, it's not like you're putting up sheetrock or a fence, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like I watch Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe, and I'm like, I've, I've never worked a day in my life. Yeah. I mean, that's how I, I, I think of it. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's work. When they say it's, you know, when I tell the kids all the time, it's a job. Absolutely. There are days when um, you would rather do anything than say the same line that you've said that's every day for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and after a while, like, keeping it fresh and keeping it growing, um, we have a saying at Peacock all the time, if it's not growing, it's dead. And, and keeping that alive, keeping the, the, the spark of what you're working on, even if, I mean, they're not all, you know, they're not all terribly moving pieces either, yeah. you know? Like, it's, you know, you get, Victor Victoria wasn't high art at its finest, right. you know? It's, it's Blake Edward's right. silliness, yeah, you know? Yeah. So um, it's a lot of shot in Freud and people getting their hands slammed into pianos and falling downstairs backwards, you know? Um, but, you know, after a while, it's really hard to keep that, that, that fresh because you want it to be mm -hmm. for an audience and you want... Right, because it's the first time they've seen it. Right. It's like going to Disney World. Yeah. yeah. So you want it to be completely immersive for them. You want it to be completely authentic them not just entertainment you want it to be authentic you want them to but after a while you know you yeah you run as many different tactics on on objective as you can possibly think of and uh, you know the directors come back and the, the company directors constantly and the stage managers they they keep tabs on stuff I, I think it gets very difficult but i would never say it was hard mm -hmm. like you know like it's never it's exhaust some of these shows are exhausting sure i mean the kids just finished newsies yeah. that's a pretty athletic show like okay. I, I can't imagine doing that for years on end um, I would imagine the turnover is... Uh, yeah, pretty great. It, it, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. So, uh, um, so yeah, you, I got tired of living in a suitcase. Okay, that's where I wanted Which was the next. phrase. Yeah. Um, I always say that to my wife. I was a man in a suitcase. It was an old police song that I liked. Because um, uh, you got tired. You got tired of not having any roots. And um, I did, anyway. Um, and maybe that's because of my background. Maybe because I had... A really happy childhood, and you know, I had parents that were really supportive, and a brother in a home, and um, it was. And my brother was taking, and you know, my brother was, uh, my brother was building a family at this time while I was being this rock star, right? In my own mind, uh, and I, I missed. I, I had had a little fling with a girl in New Hampshire, Heather, mm. and my, my wife, and. Um, mm. Do we want to extract that? No, you, you can. Uh, absolutely. I'm not going there. She's my favorite topic to talk about. Uh, I see. Um, and I missed her terribly. And um, I, I just felt like I was always at the road. And How long does the, the aura 
last in the play. I mean, you get cast, mm -hmm. you're in the play. Weeks, is it over in a couple of weeks? I mean, you're like, holy crap. No, 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 no. I would say you're deep into it for months. Oh, yeah? At least for me. I don't know what everybody's experience is yeah. probably different. I, I was probably into it for a couple months. About three months, though, you start to feel um, stayed. Um, and then there's, like, quickening moments. You know, someone will leave the cast and someone else comes in, and that helps. Or, um, you know, like I understudied three different people. And then, you know, after a while, somebody's eventually going to take off. Somebody yeah. eventually gets sick or they move on to the next project or something like that. And then, um, and I was never in any of these original Broadway companies, you know. So, like, I, on the way up here, I was listening to the, you know, the OBC cast recording of Hades Town, And I'm thinking, wow, I want to see that group right now. Because the minute they start putting in replacements. Gotcha. That's going to change, right? The mm -hmm. the chemistry's got to change. Sure. Lane is ten years after it opened. Like, I got to see it in previews. It was. And you were probably devastated visceral. when they had to change someone in Cats. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> they just changed the kitty litter. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, like so, like, but the shows take on new. They have new life. Right. They have to, right? You get a different person in it. All of a sudden, it's not me and Richard Chamberlain, and it's me and you, mm -hmm. you know? And so, like, the chemistry is different, the, the delivery is different, the, the objective, the tactic, all of that stuff kind of changes a little bit. And that you welcome that because mm -hmm. it's fresh and it keeps it authentic. Um, I, I think it's really, it, it's, it becomes work trying to find anything that isn't deadly in your work. To keep everything sort of alive and growing and fresh, the, the deadly theater is the worst type of theater. Like where it's too slick, it's too calculated, it doesn't feel like it's a real conversation. I mean, that that's the stuff that I, I live for now as a director. Like, I, I want this stuff to be... Fresh. 100% authentic. Mm. That's impressive. I don't hear that conversation very often. No? No. I, maybe it's because... Well, edit this part out. <laughs> A, I think that there aren't enough people who care. There are some. There are, there are, I do not want to, that's not a generalized statement. There are, I think that there aren't enough people, it's bowling night for some people. You know what I mean? Sure. It, it's their softball game night, you know? And so they don't care to keep it fresh. They're just there to have a good night out. They're going to go through rehearsal and they're going to throw something up there. Sometimes what you f saw them do in auditions is all they're ever going to give you, which is a shame. It's not a shame. I, I mean, there's a lot of people that are... I, I love a lot of the amateur theater that I see up here. I, I Really, when I moved up here, I, I wasn't really moving up for Heather. I wasn't really moving for love. You know, and, and um, I thought I was leaving theater He doesn't behind. mean that, Heather. He, he moved here for love. I, oh, I have 100%. She knows. I didn't th I thought I was getting away from the theater world entirely when I would move up here. Oh, that's I, interesting. I really did. I thought it was the wilds of New Hampshire. I, yeah, it is. Yeah. I didn't know that there were... Yeah, there's zebra running wild up here. No, but you have... I mean, there's a huge group of theater. There, there's levels of theater com the that's community true. up here. Like, you got, you got professionals up here, and you have amateurs who, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I like your phrase, bowling night. But that's kind of right. I mean, there are people who just want to do it. Yeah. It's like karaoke night for them. Right. And there's a difference between karaoke and... It's they just a night out. It's, they're away from work, and yeah. Yeah, it's what they do for a hobby, which yeah, is a shame. So, but, so uh, maybe it's because my background has been with a lot of them that I... It's refreshing to hear people who say, you know what, we got to take this to a new level. We get, there is more levels. There are more levels here. We can reach them. What do we need to do to get there? Well, I, I think for me it was Peacock Players. Yeah. Like, strangely, and that wasn't something that I sought out. Like, um, you know, the, I, I had a very, very successful life in New York, and I loved yeah, it. I lived there a little over a decade, and 9-11 happened, and it was a good time to move up here, and... And frankly, Heather and I were seeing if we, you know, we were going to be the thing that that we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Happy to say that we're more than we thought we would be. Well said. And um, I, I thought I was leaving all of that behind, and I missed it terribly. And I would I would be very depressed for many years. And then um, I would find Peacock in, in the weirdest of ways, and went into it rather haphazardly because. Um, you know, my Jedi Master Ed used to say to me all the time, "You should, you should really consider teaching. You should really consider directing." And I was like, "No, no, I'm way too selfish as a human being yeah. to to want to do that." And 
Plus, I didn't think I would have any talents for that or would be moved by that as much as I am. Um, so it was all really a surprise, but I think, um, I think the thing that I, I lost professionally was the reason to do it. Um, when all of a sudden it became about, I don't want to audition for this because of, I don't know, they're not going to pay that much money or it's not a long enough gig or I don't want to do that. Like, you know, some roles you just don't want to, you don't want to be in Cats, right? When you're a big fat guy, you don't, I don't want to put on well, the There's big cats, there's big fat cats. <laughs> oh, there's big fat cats, all right. Um, I just didn't want to, you know, there's some things I didn't want to do. And so um, uh, I started trusting real life. Uh, strangely, uh, more than I was trusting um, the temporary illusion of of the theater, um, and then I would realize that they they both uh, are so very powerful in me, both halves of it. Like the little kid that had all this fantasy life is very much still alive in me, mm. and and the, the 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 adult in me that doesn't want to live in a suitcase without roots is, is a part of me, and. Um, Peacock. When, when I discovered Peacock Players, it was this place that um, was kind of uh, had, it already had a had a great laurel about it. Like it was already really well known mm -hmm. for youth, and I didn't know that youth um, were going to be so drawn to the reality of the business. Um, and I, I think it was really easy, in truth, for someone like me to kind of stumble upon that and get into educating theater because um, here I had this wealth of really great teachers and really great professional experience. And I, in truth, I didn't really want it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really wanted to, to be able to um, share it in some way. Um, I w was never thinking that I was going to get rich or famous from any of this. Um, and, and now you are. Well, I, I have this stuff. Yeah, I'm right. not rich or famous. <laughs> Um, hardly fan. I know. <laughs> um, I don't, people don't know me unless they're under the age of 18, which is really sad. Um, that's almost a scary thought. It's a really scary thought. Could, so you made an allusion to, uh, or you alluded to, this uh, discovery of Peacock. How did that come about? You, you leave New York, you don't have a job, I assume. And you're coming to New Hampshire, and how do you stumble upon Peacock? What um, I was bartending in New York, um, and I might as well bartend up here. Um, really, was my thought. You know, you know, I would do um, when uh, my bread job in New York when I wasn't working in the casting office or working. Well, once, once I started working professionally as an actor, it was trying to find temporary jobs when you were home in New York, which wasn't a lot. Luckily for me, I wasn't I wasn't home a lot, so I would temp. Um, I was temping at Bear Stearns, which doesn't exist anymore, or Solomon Smith Barney. That building doesn't exist anymore because of 9-11. So um, uh, it was a good time, 9-11. I was actually, my birthday is September 10th, um, and I turned 30. I was up here visiting Heather, um, and I was supposed to go home on that Tuesday, the 11th. But everybody was calling Heather and I, don't go back, don't go, don't go home, don't come home. City's under martial law. So it was like a... It was uh, really fortuitous in a weird way. I just stayed in New Hampshire for two weeks, like all of us. We just yeah. sat and watched the TV. No one had any idea what was going on. Um, I was talking to my roommates. We lived in Brooklyn Heights, so we were right across the river there. So, um, you know, and they were sending me pictures and stuff like that. And I couldn't believe that, that, that you know, yeah. that the city had changed that dramatically. Um, but it really had. Um, and that's when Heather and I started having the conversations like, hey, maybe you, we should. Maybe you should stay. Um, maybe we should take a look at us. and Because um, it was undeniable. We really loved each other, and the long-distance part of it was really... It's still oozing out of you. It's really tough. Yes. It's really tough. I'm actually, now that I'm talking about it, the minute I leave the recording studio, I'm going to go to Gibson's bookstore and <laughs> sweep her up and give her a huge kiss. Um, um, but it, uh, Peacock, the way it handed up, uh, when I had moved up here, I was bartending, and I, I was really depressed because I thought I had just given up kind of a lot, right? Yeah. And I had friends in New York that were telling me. Sure, you had Richard Chamberlain, Sigourney Weaver, Julianne, <laughs> all your these friends. These are not friends. Yeah, okay. These are not friends. Uh -huh. These are people I still care sure, about. Sure, sure. Um, no, I don't I, get Christmas cards from them, I can tell I, you that. I remember Stuart telling me, he was like, you're going to go crazy up there. You're going to go crazy. You don't know what you're going to do. And I was like, you're not, you're not wrong. 
you're not wrong. Um, but I missed the game. I missed the war. Um, luckily, my agent was still sending me out for things, and I was still clinging to the whole jump on a Greyhound bus, go down to Boston, go down on, you know, yeah. bus over to New York, audition. Um, and I don't know, I was booking this and that, but I wasn't booking heavy because my heart wasn't into it, right? And um, Or it wasn't right for it or whatever. And I had a big audition for the full Monty on Broadway, which I desperately wanted to do. Um, of course. It, it really spoke to me. And I, I, was, I was down to the wire for the character of Dave, and I remember having to go in and strip in front of Terrence McNally. And I remember get, and when you're finished with the dance number, it's not like they let you get dressed. You're just like, okay, thanks, and you gather up all your clothes and you go out in the hallway. Oh, that's creepy. Yeah, and we're all like out in the hallway getting dressed. This, us, us big fat guys. Okay, my eyes hurt. And that's, I'm ter that's terrible. No, and the girls were auditioning for their parts down the hall, so they were all hooping and hollering at us. And I remember thinking, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> this is not. I remember having that conversation. That was a hard conversation. They didn't care parents. for the spotlight at that point, huh? No. It wasn't about you then. No, I really wanted to do it though because I thought it would be a huge, it would be a huge like physical hurdle yeah. to be able to do that okay. show to yeah. do that part. Um, but I wasn't that heartbroken that I didn't get it. In truth, because um, I didn't want to be naked on stage. I just, just nobody wants it. I know. So um, I don't want to be naked by myself in the bathroom. <laughs> Never mind on stage. I went back up to New Hampshire. Um, Heather's sister, Janelle, um, was working down at the American Stage Festival in Nashville. Oh, in Milford. Yep. Yeah. And she got Heather a job working at at the at the stage festival. Um, she w Heather was the box office manager when I would walk through the doors there for the first time. And that's kind of how we met, um, which is weird because now I work at that theater. So I see ghosts all the time. I'm always I'm always haunted by them all the phases of our relationship, which is pretty pretty special for us. Um, but Janelle, Janelle was the one that was like, hey, um, uh, Peacock Players had, ju had just lost their artistic director, and so, um, at the time, and um, they were looking for directors for the season. And she was like, hey, have you ever done any of that? And I was like, I don't know, I took a directing class in school. Um, I don't know that I was particularly good at it. I was bossy, and um, I don't know that I it was a lot of work, is what I remember directing with being. It was a lot of like I would think. having to think through all these different aspects of a production and all the elements. And I remember thinking, I can't do what Ed does. I, I'm not that talented. But I was missing the game so much. And they were like, oh, it's youth. And I was like, I don't want to work with the youth. I mean, they don't take the craft seriously. I don't, you know, I, I was so wrong. Ray, I was so wrong. Yeah. Um, I went and did this little show at Peacock Play. They, for whatever reason, they hired me. I didn't tell them about my background. They didn't ask. Really? Um, they knew that I had a degree in theater and music, but they did not know that I had had the professional credits that I did, and I didn't really advertise. So you didn't pull in any chits from Julie Andrews or Richard or Nathan, huh? Uh, no, I did uh, not. Interesting. Um, I, in fact, they wouldn't find out until after the show closed, and the kids started Googling me, and they would... They Googled me and found, like, reviews and pictures and headshots and my resume and stuff like that. And then the cat was out of the bag at that point. But Oops. but at, at that point, we had kind of really fallen in love with each other. Like, it was a group of, um, it, was a, it was a group of kids. I think the, the first cast it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory it was the show they offered me. And I remember being into it because it was a big fantasy title. I wanted to do a fantasy title. How long ago was this? say 2005 okay oh i think it was yeah i want to think it was january of 2005 and um it was an 18 person cast and they told me this after the fact because i didn't know i didn't have any experience with peacock before that so um but i guess 13 of them made main stage debuts so there was this whole group of kids that would always try to audition in peacock players that couldn't get arrested at an audition <laughs> right <laughs> and apparently i cast a bunch of them and that started a stir, from from what I've been told. First day on the job. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know. I just took kids that I thought were funny, and personable, and and we put on a great show. Is it the best production of Charlie and Chocolate Factory in the world? Probably not. But um, I realized how much I really enjoyed empowering them, 
and I would watch their parents watch them and the, the way that their parents felt watching them like it was such a I'm sorry to get modeling about it but like it was such an experience that I guess I I didn't remember from my past yeah so um, so I uh, I was immediately taken by it and it was really hard to bartend after that mm. um, and then they were very insistent um, some director had fallen through and Krista Sequenzis, um she was the executive director at Peacock at the time um you know, it was really clear that this was an emotional experience for the cast and for me and for everybody and the parents and everybody involved. And um, she asked if I would fill in and, and direct their next production, which was Oklahoma, which I've always liked. Um, uh, I've always liked Oklahoma. Um, I've done it a couple times, and um, I was really excited to do it. Um, but they told me it was a family show so that the parents would also be in this production. Okay. It was like a summer thing, and uh, I jumped in. I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. There were 65 people in the oh show. Oh, my God. And it was parents and kids, and, I mean, Farmer and the Cowman, there were so many people on the stage, you couldn't even see their feet. Like, it was just like a sea of heads. And they were all really into it, and I was really charmed. But when we talk about the amateur... Yeah. Um aspect of, of theater up here and I was just so charmed by the fact that these people wanted to do this and the and there were a couple board members there were people that played as board members that were in the show and it was during that production um, that they were all like wow this, you know, we, we, we want to kind of retain your services would you be interested in being the artistic director and I, <laughs> I remember laughing and going no of course not. Like, I know what artistic directors do. I've watched them. Like, um, <laughs> I, I, I thought, there's, there's, I don't, I don't, I'm, I, I really am underqualified to be an artistic director. I still feel that way. <laughs> um, I, I like being a director. It's probably where um, I, I think my real talents lie. But, like, you know, picking seasons and producing, and this was way above and beyond mm. anything that I had kind of done before. Um, I turned him down flat. And just said, hey, look, I really appreciate the vote of confidence, but I don't know that I can do this. And um, they were very persistent, thank God. Um, there are two gentlemen in particular, Rick Sussman and Greg Lawrence. They cornered me again at the back of the VOM. Uh, VOM left as far away from the audience as possible. And they cornered me in the VOM and they said, Keith, we realize that this is kind of a fixer-up theater company, but it, it really needs somebody like you and these these kids are inspired by your story and you have um, some sort of accessibility to communicate your past and um, we realize you don't know what you're doing but no one really does um, and luckily they were persistent and I'd had a really shitty night at the restaurant where this lady just let into me and so I was just like you know what I don't want to work for, at a restaurant anymore I'll go to prison before I work in a restaurant again. <laughs> so I, I said, yeah. I didn't really know what I was saying yes to. I inherited a season that somebody else picked. Was this still in 2005, 2006? Yeah, I want to say, yeah, we were going into 2006. No, no, it was 2005. Okay. 2005. And um, I just started, I don't know. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, but they were having me direct like three or four shows a year and, and helping other people direct these shows and I took to the directing part of it great. And I pulled out every old textbook that I possibly could. And I started calling my masters and asking them for advice. Really? For real? Yeah. And um, I had a great phone conversation. It was one of the last that I would have with um, my Jedi master, Ed Vaughn. And I said, Ed, I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, Keith, nobody knows what they're doing. He goes, you tell the story. Craft the story the way you want it told. He goes, maximize the drama and keep it action-oriented. People talk all the time about character, and they fill out these character forms, and they talk endlessly about character. He goes, it's all about action. It's all about playable action. That's why they call them plays. It's why they call it acting. He goes, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. He goes, you can have all those conversations. They're certainly very helpful. But he goes, just talk to the kids about what they're doing. What are you doing on stage? Where are you going? Where are you coming from? What do you got to get done in the scene? 
Um, he threw some really helpful books at me. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Peter Brooks, who's um, he, he wrote a book called The Empty Space. Um, he was uh, a very prolific director in the 70s. He was directing major opera pieces and stuff like that. And um, He talked in his book a lot about deadly theater, like the worst types of theater that you could have. You know, he really talked about the purposes of theater really were to not only to entertain, but to inform and to educate. And I started really liking this. I thought, wow, this is, this is something that's really authentic. This is something that makes the theater experience something in the moment, rather than just you know rehashing the same production of Anything Goes you've seen mm -hmm. over and over and over again. He was talking about like what's happening in the room, the the director at the back of the house biting his fingernails, the two actors on stage, the audience. You got an audience of three hundred some people. We're all thinking the same thing at the same time, and we're having this cathartic unity in a room together. And that becomes really sacred. It becomes something in a world full of video screens and and black mirrors where all just tap, 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 tapping on the glass. Like, that makes it even more important. And I don't know. I, I see my students... It's a really remarkable way to put it, that cathartic, all of us feeling the same thing at the same time. He used, to say that, he used to say that um, it's the only the theater was the only art form that could really do it. It could really combine all the other art forms in the moment. I don't. I, I challenge. I was. I always like to challenge all the ideas, but like, um, I, I, I think he's somewhat right. Like, film. You know, we're going to film a scene. And mm -hmm. The audience is going to. The audience is going to see Endgame at a different time than you know you see Endgame and. Right. You know, Game of Thrones was <laughs> finale was filmed a, almost a year in advance. You know, um, but like in the theater, you know, we're, we're doing Newsies last weekend. I'm watching those two young actors on stage, and they're give and take. And I'm watching the audience, and everybody's just there. Everybody's right there, and and I think because they're young, I, I prefer working with young artists. I do because I think their emotions are stronger to some extent because they're having them for the first time. Wow, I hadn't thought of that. You know, they're experiencing, uh, they're experiencing love. Mm -hmm. Like their ideas of love and hate and revenge and that stuff is sharper for them. We, we've, we've experienced it time and time again and um, uh, I think their, their emotional instruments are probably finer tuned. To some extent, and so I, I people ask all the time because I I'll, I'll moonlight sometimes up at the Winnie Playhouse, and mm -hmm. I work with the professionals up there, which scratches a total different itch for me, mm -hmm. and I love that. I love that whole experience. I love working with all of those people up there. Um, but then I come home to Peacock, and I, I I love working with the kids because their successes are huge leaps and bounds, and and it's you get this sort of double layered gobsmack when you see one of the productions. You're just like, wow, that's really just good theater. And then <laughs> and then you remind yourself, holy shit, these kids are 17 years old. Yeah. This kid's 8 years old. How are they capable of that? Yeah. Um, and so I think you leave feeling elated because of it. I like your uh, observation about their emotions. Um, trying, I was trying to put a word on it, but I, I don't think I can. I think the newness of it, right, is correct, but there's a rawness because it's there. They're in the early stages of we have we've learned to dull them down, right, or suppress a lot of them, or try to manage them. Whereas they're in full throttle. Yeah, and that's uh, that. That's those are really tricky waters um, to swim in. Yeah. I won't lie, because I mean you're. You, um, it ruffles a little, <laughs> our joke down at, at the theater is it ruffles a lot of peacock feathers, right? You know, um, but I always reassure parents. I'm like, you know, we've, and we haven't shied from some topics. I mean, we've done productions like Spring Awakening and Heather's and Chicago, and, um, and we get some eyebrows. I won't lie. Um, but in truth, these shows are aimed at that age range. I mean, it would be no different if we got to work on Dear Evan Hansen. Like, these kids do have suicidal tendencies, um, 
and I, I, can, I can't think of a better way for them to work through their um, their sexual awkwardness or their um, their feelings about worthiness and enoughness. Like, and these shows deal with them mm-hmm. directly, and I, uh, I've seen, uh, I've seen the organization, I've seen the projects, literally save these kids' lives. Like, I, I, I have, I have personally witnessed um, emp- empathic growth um, for them to work with each other and collaborate on something, and, and with us. I mean, I, I think it's hard to really, you know, what. You know, say you're a 17 year old kid. It's really hard to to, to work with a 47 year old man. Yeah. Like you know, like what what do we really have in common at, at, at the end of the day, uh, other than you know, personal experience and, and and working on the project together. And the projects they all sort of dictate it. But I always reassure the parents. Uh, our job is really the same. The, I mean, the resident artists that we have down at Peacock, Henry, Val, Andrea, Mary Ellen, Christina. Sarah and I, I mean, we're all working, uh, we're all working at the same thing that the parents are. We're trying to get that tree out of the acorn, you know, mm-hmm. um, and where it gets um, complicated is uh, is the how, right? Um, but it really comes back down to the work, you know. Some parents are more comfortable with it than others. I don't give them any sort of censorship when they're working. I treat them, we all do, we treat them like professionals. For the most part, they have to assimilate at high school. Mm-hmm. You know, they all have to dress the same way, like the same type of music, wear the right clothes. If they're not, then then they, uh, you know, they're ostracized or they're orphaned from their community. At Peacock, it's quite different. It is definitely an island of misfit toys, um, and I would say that about the adults as well. But like, they are there to be whoever they are. It's okay to be gay, and it's okay to be. It's more than okay to be gay. It's it's okay to talk the way you want to talk, and and through all of that, I think they learn respect and they learn empathy for each other, um, and that's where I think the work gets way beyond just putting on some plays. This is interesting because, in my ignorance, you know, I think of youth theater as this cat corralling effort. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's hormones. It's, uh, they it's, got there's tech. You know, they're all on their phones, and you know, they're they're running around giggling and horse playing. And but I, in, again, in my ignorance, didn't think about that other side. You're you're working with humans in development. You are you're a mentor. You're a leader. You're a former. In other words, you're, you're helping them to form who they are, want to be, will be. Maybe don't even know what they they ultimately are or whatever. I mean, I really didn't think about that. Um, much to my chagrin. I don't know that all youth theater does. I, I think it's the type of work that I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly the type of work that I, I see our little circle of resident artists that, that we've all sort of been drawn there for one reason or other and we can't leave and I think <laughs> I think that's why I think I think it's more important than just putting on the shows yeah I think it's um, it's the kids I mean in some ways you put on the hat of a sociologist and a psychologist and, right I mean you I, are I think they're very very similarly uh, linked I think the um, I mean you invite these these young people in and you accept whatever's about to happen. Now, I'm sure that there are parameters somewhere. It has to be something. Oh, there. absolutely. And so once they're inside your house, uh, things happen because you, you let it happen organically. Yes. Um, I, I also think it's important to... Uh, I, th- I think it's really important to focus on the work. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because it's really the project that's the the, the divining line. It's what they're there for. Yeah, right? So, like, it's really no different than working um, professionally. Yeah. Except um, I think that, that, you know, there's definitely some mentorship about it. Well, it has to be. I mean, it's funny. When I go to work at the profession, when I go up to Winnie, I'm always, um, 
I'm always taken aback a little bit because I, I don't really know how to work any other way, right? So, like, because um, uh, it's sort of, um, I don't want to say self-taught because that's, that's really wrong. Um, but it's been, the directorial style has been an amalgamation of a bunch of really awesome people. Yeah. And I'm stealing from all of these people and I've kind of created this, um, I guess in a weird way, a character that I play, right? So, like, it's a role. Um, and um, it's funny when they react about it because they're just like, because the, the mentoring part of it extends to them because I don't really know any other way to do it. Sure. Right? It's like a nature so, now. Right. So it's just the way it work. So um, I get very close with the professionals that I work with, and it becomes very therapeutic. I think it's very much, I've never been to therapy. Um, I've watched a lot of you know, The Sopranos. It, it. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched a lot of The Sopranos, and I guess that's what I'm taking from therapy. I don't know. Um, sociopaths and therapy. Um, but um, it is very, uh, I think the director-actor relationship is very therapeutic. It is like, okay, what do you want? And how do you want to go about getting that? And the how, that tactic, is really, um, there's so many different options there, right? So, yeah. um, so uh, you know, working on any role, um, <laughs> the, the bigger ones, the smaller ones, the incidental ones that walk across, what they provide to the actual show. Right. Um, I, love throwing, I love throwing them at the work. Because it, it takes the awkwardness out of them thinking about themselves. Mm. Like, we look at the text. We look at the score. We look for, you know, that key signature changes and it moves to this key, the, this key for a reason. But why is Sondheim doing that? Sondheim yeah. doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> he's not right. mortal like you and I, right? So, like, <laughs> if, if he's doing something like that, why is he doing it? What is it telling us? And, like, the answers are right there in the page, which I think the kids today can really respond to because they're an immediacy generation, right? Like right. They have answers. Siri can answer their questions for them. Google can answer their questions for them. So um, they respond well to having, hey, oh, there, there are roadmaps here that I can follow? This is great. And then they find it with the people that they're working with, mm -hmm. that they're sitting, you know, that they're, sing that they're singing with. They can sync up. Yeah. I, it's just, it's, because then it's a collaboration. So at one point, it's just them. And then they understand, oh, it's a, it can be a collaborative event. No, and they go through phases, too. Yeah. Like, you know, they come in, and at first it's just them figuring out an awareness of the audience and, a, and an awareness of themselves in physical space. And, and we have kids at, at Peacock Players that are, we have students that are, they're strictly recreational. Mm -hmm. And we have students there that are career artists, un, un, undoubtedly. Um, we've seen, you know, our alumni kind of do that. So, um, and I, I think it's all fine. It's all great. Like we're we're really happy to, to to collect as many of them for a short amount of time as possible because I, the 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 results of a theater mind are are necessary. Mm -hmm. They're necessary in in our world. They're necessary in our community. Empathy and understanding other people. That stuff is more important now probably than ever. Yeah. God, we're out of time. I can't believe this. We're just getting started. I have so many questions for you. We can go get a beer someplace else. Yeah, no, I need to tape it, though. i got to get this down. I got, can you come back? Can of I get course, you back? Of course. Oh, of course. Man. I have so many questions. You've opened up so many tangents that I, I didn't even think about that I wanted to talk to you. I had no about. idea what we were going to talk about to that. So. <laughs> um, oh, but thank you for coming in. I mean that sincerely. No, absolutely. I, uh, I, I'm almost emotional because you've opened up these cavities that uh, I, I, I'm now realizing are, are out there. So I want to delve into more of them because there's things I want to know about the dynamics of the first time some of these young kids face an audience and, the, and I, the, how they feel. And I'd love to bring some of them in. Oh, to we to need you. to do that. We need to do that. Is, are they, they really are the most inspirational thing. Like mm -hmm. people are always like, how, "How is Peacock Players doing this time and time and time again?" And I'm telling Which you, another one of my questions. It, it's not the people behind the curtain yeah. that are doing it. There's I mean, a blueprint somewhere. The, it, these kids are willing to do it, and that is courageous. Mm -hmm. That they're willing to do it. You see these kids that are, are, are recognized time and time again at, at the award shows yes. or on stage. The reason that they're being recognized is because they're. They're putting themselves out there. They're doing it. They're open to the experience. And nothing's going to stop them. All right. Thank you. All right, friend.
Rejoice. And there you have it. Another great one in the tank. That one's going off to the memorial. Have a great day.